Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Dream Unfinished Orchestra's YouTube show. We're so excited that you're here. Uh, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about TDU and the founding of TDU. And in our yet unheard segment, uh, we're going to be speaking about a lesser known masterwork by an underrepresented composer. Uh, my name is Sarah Overton. I'm the production manager for the Dream Unfinished, and I'm joined today by Ed Lee, who is the executive director and co-founder of the Dream Unfinished. Um, so I'm so excited to be talking with him uh, about just how this unique concept for orchestra, for an activist orchestra, got started. We'll be talking about the founding of TDU, how our inaugural concert and its centerpiece selection really resulted in the name of the organization, uh, and we'll be doing that in two segments. Um, again, we'll just be talking about the founding of the TDU at the beginning, and then in our yet unheard segment, which is our segment on lesser known masterworks by underrepresented composers, we'll be talking about plain chant for America. Uh, so plain chant might be a term that is new to some of you, uh, and plain chant music is actually a very old term. It comes from Renaissance music. So plain chants in music is uh, really liturgical music where religious texts are kind of sung to a single line. Um, so it's, it's really just telling one story in that single line, sort of free rhythm, so no real rhythmic meter uh, to go along to it. And what's so interesting uh, about this is that this plain chant for America may or may not really be kind of an example of a plain chant. I know Un has a lovely example of the plain chant for America. Can you share that with us, Un? Yeah, well, I think we should first actually hear that contrast of what a plain chant is, which I think this is actually one of those musical terms where people probably know what it is, but they just didn't know what to call it. So this is an example of a pretty classic plain chant. And we'll just hear like, a few seconds of it. So as Sarah was saying, um, what we just heard, I think people are familiar with vaguely, like it's sort of quoted musically a lot, right? And, and um, just to recap for that particular definition, what we just heard, it's uh, monophonic, meaning that it's all um, one melodic line. And then as we heard, like there aren't any instruments, right? There isn't like a piano accompaniment or an orchestra accompaniment. Um, Whereas, yes, this piece, Plain Chant for America, which we're featuring today, it's, um, it actually exists in a few different forms, but definitely multiple voices and definitely lots of accompaniment. In fact, like a full orchestra <laughs> is accompanying it. So we'll be talking a little bit more about like where we, our hypothesis for like why the title refers to this, you know, kind of medieval era um, genre that we just sampled um, but then why that's being transposed to a piece that's obviously none of the things that we just heard. Yeah, I love that. And, and just to build on that too, what was interesting about the plain chant example is that it can be many voices singing one line as well. It doesn't have to be a singular voice singing one line. Um, but a lot, just like you said, and um, you know, this plain chant for America is very different from what we think of as plain chant. And I think, um, you know, the theory that we kind of came to uh, was that there, uh, the plain chant for America is really based on a piece of poetry uh, by Ka uh, Catherine Garrison Chapin Biddle. Um, and in this poem, there is a, uh, it's sort of like a call to action almost at the end. Um, and it's one line or, uh, it, or it's a, a few lines really that are in this text um, that have the singular summation of, of this, uh, of what she's trying to evoke through the poem. Um, and it reads saying, tell them again, say it America, say it again till it splits their ears. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. Yep. Yeah. Freedom, till it splits their ears. Freedom is the salt in our blood and its bone shape. If freedom fails, we'll fight for more freedom. This is the land and these are the years. 
when freedom's a whisper above their ashes, an obsolete word cut on their graves, when the mind has yielded its last resistance and the last free flag is under the waves. Let them remember that here on the rest Western horizon, a star once acclaimed has not set, and the strength of a hope and the shape of a vision died for and sung for and fought for and worked for is living yet. Um, so, I mean, what a gorgeous, what a wonderful poem and, and wonderful text to take from, to make music from. You can already hear some of the music, but just the singular call to action, the singular vision um, of freedom and the fight for freedom really spoke to us, I think, in, uh, you know, kind of how plain chant worked in medieval times. Um, so, and I, I want to ask you just, just going sorry. from the poem to medieval plain chant and, you know, kind of all of these things, how did they sort of come together, uh, you know, for the founding of TDU? Yeah, so I, I do think we should kind of, I will organize myself in, in talking about the founding of TDU and then also diving more deeply into the, the plain chant for America specifically and how it showed up in our naming. And I loved that theory that you just said earlier, Sarah, around like pointing out that plain chant can be, even though it's one melodic line, it is many voices singing one. And maybe we should talk about that a little bit more, but, but so yes, how TDU was founded. So, um, so this goes back to 2014. And um, as folks may know, currently I am employed as an arts administrator, but in 2014, I was a teaching artist. Um, and so I was doing early childhood music. I was uh, teaching woodwinds and I was doing kind of the classic teaching artist thing. Like I was also a barista, like just this kind of patchwork portfolio uh, career. And um, I, 2014 was when Black Lives Matter really became mainstream, became something that was being regularly reported about in, um, in, in news outlets and um, I, and obviously uh, I, I think the whole country in that moment was kind of swept in this. Um, well, let me let me rephrase that. I would say that um, there was a much broader awakening and awareness to these kinds of issues um, nationally than I think had been in play prior. And um, so I would count myself as one of those people who um, it was really through BLM that I um, just honestly even became aware of things like police brutality. And so, you know, a lot of it, first of all, was just me kind of getting square with myself. Like, I lived a certain kind of life where I could get away with not having to know about these sorts of things and not having to have these kinds of conversations about these topics with the people that I knew. Um, so, so, so some of it was, you know, frankly, deeply personal. And, and what I was experiencing, I think, was ex experienced just on a broader scale. Um, but then I think some of it also was specific to my practice as a musician um, and wondering, you know, particularly because at the time I was um, teaching, um, in in a in a in a, a like a children's orchestra program and you know this is true i think of many music education initiatives um where there's this kind of narrative around how you know mozart can save kids <laughs> or um and, and that's true not only of very large arts institutions but also very small ones um and and particularly the, in a more popular narrative in the last i would say 10, 15 years of like social change through music. And a lot of these nonprofit organizations are, you know, branding themselves as being vehicles for social change in their communities and, and serving, uh, you know, black and brown children and putting the faces of these children all over their marketing materials. Um, but then like in 2014 and 2015, none of these organizations were really publicly making any kind of statements around these topics that, you know, um, uh, these are topics that are supposed to be impacting the very communities that they're claiming to serve. So there was just a lot of questioning too around that part of 
you know, our, what it was happening in terms of the kind of broader field and sector around me. So, so with these kinds of realizations, um, for a time, really, I would say at least a couple of months, um, maybe even three months or so, I was doing a lot of weird Google searches. Um, I was searching for, you know, Black Lives Matter classical music, <laughs> Black Lives Matter orchestra, um, because Frankly, you know, at the time, as I said, I was early childhood music um, woodwind teaching artist. So I was I was playing the clarinet and I was singing with babies. And I assumed that, like, if someone was already doing something about this, then it would be really cool to hitch onto that bandwagon because, like, surely I couldn't do anything, um, you know, of my own. And so I did all these weird Google searches and was really coming up with very little. And so then one day I at the time I was actually still on Facebook. And so I posted a Facebook post saying like, is there anything that classical musicians can do right now? Um, and there was actually, you know, quite a bit of uh, brainstorming in that post. And then there was a suggestion from Richard Miller of Upbeat NYC, which is a wonderful organization in the Bronx. You should definitely check them out if you're a big fan of music education. But um, Rich Miller had suggested like, what if we did uh, some sort of benefit concert for different civil rights organizations that are related to doing these kinds of topics? And um, that was basically the inaugural concert. It was, a, it was conceived as a one-off. It was conceived as, a, we're going to do this one thing, this one time. Um, and frankly, none of us knew what we were doing. So, like, we hadn't applied for any grants. Like, like we... And the music program in hindsight was so ambitious. Like, I think we had something crazy, like six timpanis on the stage. I mean, like, like it was, <laughs> it was, it was, it was it, there were no sorts of um, practical <laughs> reasons that were put into question as far as trying to assemble this thing. Um, so we didn't know what we were doing, but people just felt so passionate about it. And we ended up with this 96 piece orchestra. So for people who aren't aware, that meant there were almost a hundred humans on stage. Um, and there were people who, um, you know, play with the New York Philharmonic, play with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, play in Broadway pits. So extremely high caliber of professional. And they all played for free. Uh, you know, we had a day of rehearsals prior and then the actual concert and they um, they all volunteered their time completely for for this event. And it was this crazy event. And like the people who this this sort of loose collective of people who had organized it, like none of us had slept into Sunday two hours leading up to it. Um, and it was supposed to be a one off. But it was also not only did it have this incredibly ambitious musical program, but um, it sort of birthed the format of most TDU concerts, which is embedding music with speakers. So uh, that really began our really wonderful relationship with the Center for Constitutional Rights. Uh, Vince Warren, who is their ED, he was our keynote um, and uh, just was such a passionate and inspiring speaker and now thankfully a member of our board and we do all sorts of great things with CCR. Um, also very notably as included in the speakers in that evening, um, it was Erica Garner, uh, daughter of Eric Garner. And really his passing was um, in many ways a direct catalyst to the founding of the Dream Unfinished just because I think it was the New York City response to um, what happened with his with his passing that um, I think helped to galvanize some of the work around this. And for those who are not aware, so Erica Garner became quite a prominent activist um, in in light of her father's passing. But then she actually passed away in the last couple of years. So um, we were very fortunate and very lucky to have been able to work with her for that that um, that event. And um, so it was supposed to be this one-off event. It was this beautiful event. I still remember that first concert as, it was, it was electric. It was, you could feel the sort of synergy that was existing between the people in the audience and the people on stage. Um, but it was supposed to be a one-off event. And so, you know, again, we had these 
musicians who had all played for free. And for, for those who don't know, generally after a lot of these classical music gigs, like the musicians, after it's done, they will just kind of pack up and leave, right? <laughs> like they, they sometimes have another gig. They, they, or their, their, you know, their services are, are complete. Um, but this was an instance where many of the musicians like really wanted to hang around afterwards like they wanted to digest like we all sort of collected in this tiny bar that was right next to the venue and like they were like talking about how they experienced the music and the, and the performance and then a bunch of them that night and then the days afterwards are saying okay so when are we going to do this again and that's when i realized that we had really sort of hit a nerve um and i think frankly it, some of it was also serendipitous in that, you know, not only was this a broader conversation that we were having nationally, but certainly there have been earlier versions of this, but I would say since 2014 and slightly earlier, now it's become a much more active conversation in the field of classical music. So us sort of coming on at this time, I think, helped to, like, there was already sorts of, like, momentum that kind of culminated into us deciding that this needed to be more than a one-off. Um, so then we had our subsequent concerts and slowly sort of professionalized more into um, like a collective into a 501c3. Uh, and now we're, and now we're budding YouTubers. So like, the project continues <laughs> to evolve. I love that evolution. I, I think it's, it's so fantastic and it, it speaks so much to um, you know, just the passion of everybody on TDU's team, um, you know, for, for advocacy um, and making sure that we amplify the voices of those who, who are advocating, um, you know, in, in that way. So I, I wanted to ask you and, and thank you, first of all, for just going through what it took to put TDU together in the first place, um, you know, and it's it's really wonderful to hear about musicians who just kind of banded together and, and knowing that these musicians really have a passion um, to not only be on stage, but have their voices heard in a unique way that, that combines their instrument. I just think it's, it's so wonderful to have all of these things together. Um, so I'm still curious going back to plain chant um, and, you know, kind of this this medieval chant that we heard and uh, plain chant for America, that lovely poem, how that incorporated itself into TDU's history. Yeah, so this actually owes credit to uh, James Blotchley, who was um, one of two conductors that evening, and he was the TDU's first artistic director. And then for a time, he and John McLaughlin Williams, who was the other conductor that evening, for, in, in, um, for the subsequent season, they were the co-artistic directors. So this is really, um, you know, hats off to James, who is also one of the co-founders of TDU. Um, but so the title of TDU and, and how it relates to Plain Chant for America. So um, when we were deciding the musical programming for TDU, one of the other sort of loose members of this initial collective was an ethnomusicologist named Micaiah Whitmer. And she really, urged us to look more deeply into William Grant Still's catalog. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about who William Grant Still is when we get to the Yet and Heard segment. But um, I, I was largely just familiar with his Afro-American symphony, which is um, definitely his most popular work um, in, in orchestral renderings. And wasn't necessarily a big fan of that particular piece, but she was like, no, like he has other stuff. Um, and indeed he does. He has something like over 200 pieces actually. And so, but the issue with a lot of these uh, composers is that you can see the listing of their catalog, but not necessarily be able to find the music or actually hear it. Um, so I read a lot of context about this piece, Plain Chant for America, um, and we'll actually be diving more into the actual poet and the poem and all of that. Um, but I couldn't find any sort of recording of it at all. Like I spent week, uh, weeks, and again, this was more weird Google searches. Um, I finally found it on YouTube. And so we, this is an orchestra concert, right? Um, the, the version that I found on YouTube was a solo singer with a pianist. <laughs> so like it wasn't even an actual version of what we intended on programming. Um, and I think the, the killer to all of this was that like the title of the piece, Plain Chant for America, it wasn't, it's on YouTube. It wasn't in the title description of the YouTube video. It was like in the description text. 
So I was really searching hard, <laughs> um, but I was able to find it. <laughs> and um, and and the, even though it wasn't quite what we were going to do, um, you could hear enough of the music where really we took a risk. We were like, okay, we, we know the backstory, which is incredibly compelling. Um, and we know we can hear enough of the music here where um, I think if this is in an orchestra, it's going to sound good. So let's just move forward with it. And so, as I said earlier, none of us knew what we were doing. Um, it was something like not very far away from the concert. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it was like our, our inaugural concert was in July of 2015. Um, and so maybe this was like in February or March, but we didn't have a name for this project for a very long time. Um, but when we were finally able to settle on really picking Plain Chant for America to be the centerpiece of the whole evening musically, then James, the conductor, he suggested, well, maybe we take the title from this opening text. Um, and we had flashed a little bit of the poem earlier, but I can just say this text now because I think it's so powerful by itself. Um, so the, the text opens with, the poem, Plain Chant for America, opens with, for the dream unfinished out of which we came, we stand together. I'm just gonna say that one more time. For the dream unfinished out of which we came, we stand together. So I think it should be noted that this predates Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. Um, I actually don't know where it stacks up with um, the Langston Hughes Dream Deferred um, but we realized that just this this concept and this phrase dream unfinished really captured so many it was evocative of so many things and it also was tied in so beautifully with this musical selection that was really at the core of what we were doing that evening so so james said let's call ourselves a dream unfinished and i said okay <laughs> oh that's amazing that's really amazing and i i love this this dream because it, it really was a dream of, of yours and James and everyone just to come together and, and really put something magical on the stage. Um, and it just speaks so well um, to it. And I, I want to ask you a little bit about um, kind of this the subtext of the dream unfinished because when we talk about the dream unfinished um, we often say we're an activist orchestra and that's the other part of this. So what, what exactly is an activist orchestra? And um, I, I can see some of the roots there, uh, but how are we expressing it now? How would you say we're expressing it now? Yeah, so I remember, and you know, it's really interesting kind of looking back through even like old emails or sort of thinking about conversations we were having back then, because um, it's a real sort of time capsule. like. One of the big reasons why we had the concert in 2015 was because major orchestras were not talking about Black Lives Matter. Whereas like 2020, everyone saw those black boxes up, right? So like, I think that was part of it, like that really, and, and but I think this is still true now as it was then. Like when we say the phrase activist orchestra, people almost always do a double take because, you know, as, as Dr. King has described, classical music, in his words, it was the last bastion of elitism. And so, you know, when you go to an orchestra, it's not to necessarily be socially engaged. Often it was to sort of, frankly, escape. You know, concert halls were seen as places of refuge that only a certain sort of people could afford to take refuge in. Um, I mean, I, I remember at one point actually, you know, being in a panel conversation about all of this and someone from the audience had said, well, but like, don't you ever just want to like turn off the noise? Like, like, why are you inviting yourself into that space? And to which I responded, well, not all of us are in a position where we can turn off the noise. Like sometimes the noise is our lived experience. Um, so I think that was part of it, in, you know, saying that because by having ourselves be an activist orchestra, that's like, even orchestras care about these things now, um, which I think is less radical in 2021 than it was when we started in 2015. But still, like, I think the way that we show up and the way that we care is still different than um, how, you know, other orchestras show up 
um, and, and try to engage in this work. So as far as like what it actually means for an activist orchestra, you know, as I mentioned earlier, generally the, um, the format of our programming is that we pair um, so it's a lot like this YouTube show, like we pair information with music and make sure that there is some kind of very deep and uh, close tie in between them so that uh, all of our um, seasons have operated in this model where there's some sort of central theme that's a social justice topic. And then that is really what dictates all the artistic programming. Um, so that is in practice what the um, activism has looked like on stage. That's, that's really powerful, uh, too, I think, the way that TDU does things, just because it's so agile, you know, we're really able to get really get in the weeds on a topic, um, you know, and, and really dig in uh, and express the care that we all have for for these causes, um, you know, and, and do it in a way that's really impactful. Um, so I, I want to shift a little bit and talk more about Plain Chant for America, because I think it's such an interesting and beautiful piece. And like you said, uh, William Grant still was a prolific composer. It wasn't, it, he's best known for his Afro-American symphony, but I mean, he composed operas and symphonies and um, chamber music. It was really, really incredible. He was also the first uh, Black American to conduct a symphony in the United States. Um, so, you know, he's he's lived a very uh, interesting life to, um, you know, came up in Mississippi, went to uh, the New England Conservatory of Music, um, you know, just really was a, a wonderful composer, storied composer, um, and produced actually uh, a libretto with Langston Hughes in one of his operas. Um, so really just tied into the fabric of American music and American life. Um, so William Grant Still is, is absolutely wonderful and he's got the storied history of Langston Hughes writing his libretti. I mean, wild, just really wonderful stuff. So um, he gets connected with Catherine Garrison Chapin Biddle um, to, for this poem, this Blaine Chant for American poem. Um, and, and can you talk a little bit more about how that happened, how the poem happened and, and this connection was made? Yeah, so this was actually their second collaboration. Uh, their first was a piece that um, has been programmed more recently um, as well. Um, it's the title is And They Lynched Him on a Tree. Um, and so uh, uh, she is such a long name, so I'm going to call her Chapin Biddle. Um, so Chapin Biddle, she had created this poem and then uh, William Grant still said it. And, that, and, and it's this incredibly moving oratorio. We should actually do a feature on that sometime, Sarah. I think that would be a great yet unheard. Um, but so Plain Chant for America was another poem that she had written. And um, it's, it, while I'm always sort of, I, I, I don't necessarily think it's, uh, salience always to mention like if a woman is married to a specific person. <laughs> um, I, I think in this particular instance it is because she was married to Francis Biddle who uh, served as a judge during the Nuremberg trials. And so when she started writing Plain Chant for America, it was actually pre-World War II, but ended up becoming this poem that was very much in response to, you know, this um, fight against fascism frankly, and, 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 and um, fighting for these sorts of ideals of democracy and freedom. Um, so it's this very, uh, in some ways, um, nationalistic poem, but, but I, not, well, it's not patriotic because it also sort of calls out like some of the problems that we have in America. Um, so it's an interesting poem to look at almost as like a time capsule moment, but then also like as a work in and of itself. And so um, in 1941, um, it, it was announced that this piece was going to be premiered and it was dedicated to Eleanor Roosevelt, um, who officially accepted the dedication on behalf of herself and, and her husband, FDR. So, you know, that's cool that like a composer would write something that like the first lady and and by extension the white house is saying like we are we are accepting this um and it was premiered by the new york philharmonic and it was performed at carnegie hall so you know not 
a small band and not a small hall by any means. Um, and we have this little sort of a quote around um, more of the context from some, there are two New York Times articles that we could find in 1941 about this. So this is from Allen Downs and he describes it as, Mrs. Chapin was inspired to write the poem of Plain Chant for America as a protest against fascism rampant in many places in America today and the gap in her own words between totalitarianism and the American democracy in which I believed. Um, and by all accounts, it was very well received. Um, it, it, Sarah and I were joking about this because we were able to look at the actual uh, New York Times article and on the same page, there's this like, I guess, photo of Alvin Berg. <laughs> <laughs> because like 12 tone was like hot off the presses at that moment, right? <laughs> uh, but anyway, going back to Plain Chant for America. So um, uh, frankly, it, 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 the, it, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but it said like the piece was like extremely well applauded. It was well received, but yeah. um, it was an article that was maybe this long of which like this much was around Plain Chant for America. And then this much was about a bad Chopin orchestration. And then like this much was about like a Brahms concerto or something like that. So it didn't really get much, it didn't make much of a splash, I guess, with the particular New York Times reviewer, although it was well received. Um, and then it's just interesting because, you know, we can't necessarily verify this, but I'm pretty sure that so the piece was premiered by the New York Phil in 1941. And then we performed it in 2015. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure it was not performed by an orchestra between those two performances. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not very popular as an, as an orchestral work. Um, in the last few years, there have actually been more recordings and performances of it as a choral work. So this is just a, a really quick aside, but William Grant still, even though he was as Sarah had mentioned, you know, all of these sorts of uh, credentials, right? Like first black American to conduct a symphony, first black American to have a work premiered by a major symphony, collaborated with Langston Hughes, you know, uh, w had been awarded like a Guggenheim fellowship, like all of these things. Um, but he was black and faced prejudice and often, um, what he would sometimes do is he would take a piece of music and then write it in multiple versions. And I, if I remember correctly, like sometimes that version would go to one publisher, but then another version would go to another publisher because like, number one, he was just trying to get his music out into the world. But then number two, it was also like, just to, I mean, you know, man's got to eat. <laughs> um, so plain chant for America uh, the version that we performed is for solo, voice, and orchestra. It can also exist for chorus um, and orchestra. It can also exist, as I found in 2014-15, for solo, voice, and piano, and then also for chorus and piano. So there are actually now, I would say, three or four recordings on YouTube, which you can include in our links again, um, that are the choral versions. Um, but I'm not aware of other orchestral performances, at least recently. Um, and you know, and this is unfortunate too, because frankly, as I said earlier, no one knew what we were doing. So we have a recording of our performance from 2015. It, it, the, the live performance was very well received, but the recording is not as forgiving <laughs> in terms of, you know, frankly, I'll be very honest, like the orchestra was a little bit under rehearsed and like, you know, we were, it was just this whole crazy thing. So if people are really curious and don't mind hearing a slightly out of tune orchestra, um, then we could absolutely send along our, our archival recording. If you're, if you have any interest in programming it yourself, you absolutely should. It's a marvelous work and you don't need 96 people on stage. We were just being crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, so the version that we're streaming today is actually a version that we recorded that is in tune. Um, and it is with a uh, pianist, Che Gyohan, and bass baritone, Deshaun Burton from Roomful of Teeth. So we will just play a little version, a little bit of this, and then uh, we can welcome folks to check out the full eight minute work on their own. So let me go ahead and get that all. Yes, okay. Thank you. 
think we'll leave it there for as far as and 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 please by all means if folks want to watch the video and bump up our view count <laughs> <laughs> go for it we will also include that link but but again you know this is one recording that is on youtube and there are now these other choral recordings that people could also um check out if that is the mode in which they either want to listen to it or maybe even program it themselves yeah well, thank um, you Thank you for sharing that. And um, and I mean, Deshaun Burton's voice, uh, you know, is just beautiful. Just what a golden instrument he has. And, and um, you know, the pianist is just so wonderful. So I'm, I'm glad that we got to hear a little bit of that. And I'm curious too, um, just wondering out loud if, if maybe the choral version is, is played a little more often because you can hear the text um, mm -hmm. as opposed the orchestral version so you know just just the thought that i was having is you know re-listening to this recording um so very very wonderful and like you said we'll be sure to post that link um to the performance that we just saw as well as where to purchase the sheet music um and you know where you might want to see some of these uh reviews of the piece as well um so I want to, uh, I think, close us out uh, for the evening. I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground today and just the founding of TDU, medieval plane chants, <laughs> to America, we really did it all. So, um, you know, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, next week, we're going to explore activism within and through classical music and, uh, you know, just talk about some some more TDU related things, some more classical music related things, and, and we're excited to have you. So if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to click the like and subscribe button. Leave us a comment in the comment section. We read every single one of those comments. So please leave us a comment. We would appreciate it. Um, and hopefully you'll be around next week for our next episode. We can't wait to see you then. All right. Okay. <laughs>